Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Timon Sloan with the Open Networking Foundation, and we're here today to share with you uh, details on the uh, pretty exciting announcement we made last month that ONF is going to be merging all of our projects in with the Linux Foundation. And we want to uh, try to provide a background on all of this and answer all of your questions and, uh, and help launch all these projects um, in the right direction as we move forward. So I'm really pleased to have a number of people with me here today, and everybody will be joining towards the end uh, to make sure we can answer all of your questions. Uh, but you know, I'm here with the ONF, but we also have representatives from all of the four major project areas. Uh, that includes Larry Peterson representing the mobile project, the Ether projects, uh, Nate Foster representing the P4 work, Manuel Paul representing the broadband projects, and Lynn Denong from uh, Siena representing the um, the modeling work, the open networking modeling and interfaces projects. Uh, and then additionally, Scott from Linux Foundation um, is with us here today as well. I've been working with Scott through this whole process of uh, of crafting um, sort of a new way to you know, craft these projects and, and uh, drive these projects uh, under the Linux Foundation. So it's great that Scott's here as well. Um, and, uh, you know, any kind of um, formation questions, legal questions, that kind of thing, Scott's uh, well positioned to be able to help us with. So uh, with that, and without um, more ado, let me um, sort of walk through and uh, you know what's going on. Um, but let me just mention too that we, we do have the Q and A uh, panel. Feel free to enter your questions. We want to just make sure that uh, you come away with all of your questions answered today. So um, a bit of background, uh, just to understand why we're doing what we're doing and why this is the right time to be doing it. Um, you know, over the years, um, those of you, some of you may have been with ONF for over a decade at this point in time. You know, ONF has had an amazing um, track record and, and run, um, growing from sort of humble beginnings to um, at this point having quite a broad, large portfolio. And the portfolio um, includes, you know, four major project areas, and that includes uh, Volta and broadband. It includes the mobile work and Ether. It includes the P4 and programmable networking work. And it includes the modeling work, OTCC and OIMT. Um, and, uh, but as the work has grown, the body of work has grown, what we found is that the board members' interests have diverged. And this is really to be expected, you know, especially in retrospect, that uh, you know, new projects would come in, um, board members would join interested in those projects. And so over time, you know, we've seen a divergence in interests uh, at the board. And you know, specifically Deutsche Telekom and Turk Telekom, um, are actively deploying Volta in their broadband networks today. They care a lot and they are very supportive of those projects and want to continue to invest there. Uh, Intel and Google um, are leveraging P4 broadly across uh, their portfolios. Uh, and they also are really, you know, care and are motivated around P4 and programmable networking. Um, Intel Labs, uh, a number of research organizations around the world, and notably um, uh, the U.S. government in various forms, is interested in Ether and the 5G portfolio from ONF. Uh, and then the modeling work, both CCC and the and like, um, have you know a really strong, engaged community. That work is getting deployed. Uh, you know, there was an announcement last year of Telefonica using those interfaces and deploying to I can't remember the numbers, tens of thousands of sites. And whatnot, uh, and that works used quite broadly across the SDO communities. So you know, each in their own right, an important body of work. But um, over time, we found there was sort of less and less overlap between the projects, and that we had no key stakeholders uh, really backing the collective um, anymore. So you know, I think up until about two years ago, we were seeing that kind of um, intertwining of the projects, but you know, less so over time, and that's okay. You know, the projects have to go where they naturally want to go. This is the nature of open source in many ways. And so, you know, with that background, the board really explored a lot of different options. I, I spoke with a lot of different people across the industry as we were thinking about the best course of action. And, uh, you know, what we come to came to feel was that, um, you know, in order for the projects to continue to grow, um, the projects needed to ha have their own independence um, and not be um, sort of artificially intertwined with one another. Um, we determined that Linux Foundation uh, was really the right home for creating wholly independent projects. This is, after all, what LF is really skilled at doing. You know, LF has, I think, um, over 800 projects at this point in time, um, is really well known for creating independent governance of various styles for, for projects. And I would say the experience of working with LF 
and Scott, who's with us today over the last um, period of time. Um, it's actually been many months as we've been kind of working this through, um, you know, is able to bring a lot of different uh, varied experience for different types of projects that is really quite useful. And we've crafted, you know, sort of a, a, a slightly unique path for each of the projects moving forward that suits it best. And so, you know, from ONS perspective, we saw um, LF as, as the right partner because there's number one, maybe an opportunity to rally the membership and create critical mass around the projects with this structure. Uh, to harmonize the industry under still a, a you know a single project umbrella, you know LF projects and ONF, there are places where there's a lot of good alignment, and we're already starting to see some of that um, kind of benefit from from this announcement. And uh, and it also simplifies foundation memberships for member companies. Uh, it, it just the, the legal issues of uh, joining a membership and being part of organizations like ours. So, you know, that's kind of why ONF was interested, but LF is also uh, interested in ONF for a number of reasons. You know, ONF has had a really fantastic track record, has transformed the networking, the software-defined networking world, the data center, the transport, and the broadband networking spaces. Uh, we have a reputation for um, an, an agenda-driven disruption, that really going after a space and intentionally trying to push new technologies and new approaches and driving open markets that perhaps have been uh, more closed over time. And, um, and we believe this serves the industry well and LF you know, agrees with that. And LF wants to create projects that still execute with this unique ONF model. And we want to be able to keep this unique ONF model as part of these projects. Um, and so we thought, you know, is there a way to bring ONF's DNA and meld it together with LF uh, to create something um, better and stronger moving forward? And so with that, you know, the ONF board determined that LF is the right partner for um, for this next phase of the ONF journey of the of the of the journey for the projects that have been created and launched by ONF. So, you know, best path forward being to create, uh, you know, to merge the projects with LF. You know, what are some of the details under that? You know, number one is to create three separate funded projects. And that's for broadband, for mobile, and for P4. And we'll talk about what it means to be a funded project. And then to create a fourth project uh, as an quote unquote unfunded project for the modeling work. Then to archive uh, all other projects. And, and really, all the other projects are historic at this point in time. Um, and, and I guess I should be clear that things like ONOS and micro ONOS and those things, those are not archived projects, are actually kind of uh, continue to be supported and. Um, they will actually be under the P4 and, and the programmable networking project. Um, there, there are just really some more fringe-like things, or really just some like old archives for Cord that then morphed into Volta moving forward. Uh, that will likely just be archived. They're not going to be deleted. Uh, really, nothing's going to be deleted. Nothing's going to go away. Um, the plan here is to make this as smooth a transition as possible for the technical projects, and I think you'll see that as we talk this through. Um, <clears throat> Then to ensure that each of these projects has independent governance, um, and so to really separate out the the, the governance, the, the 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 way these projects are run, and to give the projects each their own true independence. Um, and so, you know, for the funded projects, we're going to seed what are you know governing boards from the you know and leveraging and using and working with the current ONF stakeholders, many of whom you see here today on the webinar with me. Um, and then to split ONF's financial reserves equally into the three funded projects to give these projects a launch and a runway moving forward. Uh, and then, um, you know, I'll just, I'm repeating myself, but this is really important for it, to take care not to disrupt the technical operation of any of the projects. So this is just a touch of maybe structure. Think of this as the legal structure of what we're going into. So we're going from ONF, which is one monolith, and we're really breaking it apart um, intentionally to give each its own runway. And, um, and so after working with LF um, and, and really talking this through and benefiting from their experience, this is the way it's legally going to be structured moving forward. So LF, sort of the, the top level entity, the Linux Foundation, um, under the Linux Foundation, three separate directed funds are being created, each with, with its own governing board. Uh, these, these, um, these directed funds are managed by Linux Foundation. Each directed fund controls its own budget, its own money, and it oversees the direction of the projects at a high level. And each, direction, uh, each uh, directed fund has a governing board that uh, is really in charge of setting these agenda and, and, are, and setting the budget for the projects. 
And then inside a separate subsidiary legal entity of LF is this LF Projects LLC. And inside that there, there are the technical projects. And here we have four technical projects, the three funded projects and the one unfunded project. Each technical project has its own TST that guides the, the technical work of the project. And, uh, and you know, these, these arrows from the directed funds to the technical projects, these entities are, are intentionally separated because, um, you know, we, these, these directed funds are created to create a, a set of supporting organizations that want to invest in the work and help drive the work, but largely drive that work through financial investment that they have a directed fund, um, they continue to raise money to for the support of the project. Um, in all of these cases, just following the ONF model, they're going to be hiring engineers or doing things to really push the agenda and have people working on the projects or working on the TSTs or con and contributing to GitHub. Um, but they are sort of the, the separate supporting entity, this, this uh, directed fund with the governing board. Uh, the technical projects are open um, for all to participate in, and they are run by the TST. And all of our projects today have TSTs, and, and it's really the same TST that's going to be the running the project, um, you know, from day day zero to day one uh, through this transition. So again, you know, minimal minimal disruption to the technical projects is the intent. But we're going to have these new directed funds and these new governing boards uh, helping to run and drive and fund and and choose how to you know how to leverage the funding to help drive the agenda for the projects. So I'm going to take this diagram and I'm going to flip it around um, and walk you through some more pieces of this, right? So again, we have um, you know O and F is the existing you know before organization one monolith. And then we have LF as the um, new um, umbrella organization. And I'm going to talk through the three funded uh, projects first. So we have broadband, we have uh, mobile and ether, and we have uh, P4. And um, you know, for each of these, there is the technical project and then the directed fund. So I'm really just you know visually depicting this in a different way to help walk through the pieces of this. And so you know, the way this works is that uh, number one, ONF is taking its financial reserves and dividing it into the directed funds. And so, you know, you know approximately four and a half million dollars is being inserted uh, into the projects. Day one, that, that makes a million and a half into each of the projects, into each of the directed funds. And these directed funds will then really have, um, you know, ownership of that money, be able to guide, guide the budgets under the direction of LF, but it's really the governing boards that are making all the decisions about um, how those funds are used. Um, additionally, uh, as part of this, LF is putting, you know, uh, quote unquote, skin in the game as well and really interested uh, in seeing this transition be successful and, um, and um, you know, values what ONF and the ONF DNA that's being brought to the table here. And so ONF is also injecting some of its own money here, um, 400K, and that money is being split and goes into the directed funds as well to, to further increase uh, the pool of money with which they're getting launched. Uh, that money's coming in over a period of two years, uh, 200K a year. Then um, you know, membership. So after all, ONF is a membership-based organization, uh, and LF is as well a membership-based organization. Yet another reason that this is a, a, a good pairing of entities. And so, you know, ONF memberships are going. You know, today members um, pay a membership fee, and it goes to ONF again as one monolith. And that's one of the reasons we're we're moving towards this new model because we're finding that. Um, each member tends to care about one or two of the projects and wants to be able to really invest specifically in those projects. And so that's precisely what we're going to achieve with this. So, you know, ONF memberships are going to go away, but everybody's being offered an opportunity to join the new projects uh, starting today, really. And uh, uh, you, you will be able to separately choose to join one, two, or three of the new projects. And each will have its own membership structure and its own membership fee structure. Um, so, uh, you know, the um, the budgets here will be approved by the new governing boards once these get booted up, and they'll have then say over all the funds that kind of go in, into these, and then the members will be part really of these specific directed funds. So again, we'll be uh, in the position to help invest and steer the projects from a financial perspective. And then I want to just point out this last bullet here as well is that. Um, we're doing something special through the month of January until this officially closes. So we're, we're in this kind of intermediate period where, you know, um, 
we're just you know uh, coming up to to the sort of the final legal transition, which is to happen at the end of the month, and that ONF members um, during this period of time can get a prorated credit for any unused portion of your membership with ONF. So let's say that um, you, you signed up in October with ONF. So you may still have you know October, November, December sort of used in your annual membership, and you have nine months left. Um, any then uh, residual you know um, part of that membership fee, that nine month of worth of your membership fee can be applied towards the new projects as you join. Um, but uh, that's available during this intermediate period. And so you need to join by the end of the month. And so I encourage you to take a look at this um, you know quickly. Um, we think it would be a pretty straightforward joining process. But uh, in order to take advantage of that priority credit, uh, you need to act right away. So additionally, you know, again, the goal here is for the seamless transition and for things to be smooth. And uh, you know, a lot of what makes the projects tick and you know, at least keeps the infrastructure in place and whatnot are the people that uh, have institutional knowledge and that know the community. And so I'm really pleased that I think we found a pretty smooth way to, to move all the piece parts to uh, be able to achieve what we're after here. And so one of the, the really important parts is that the team is um, is moving with all of this as well. And so the individuals uh, staffed by ONF um, that are really working across all of the projects include uh, Michelle, who's helping to run this webinar today, and uh, David, who goes by DAF and Joey. And uh, many of you may know these names, right? Because they, they are um, active in the projects and in the TSTs and, and, and helping with backend infrastructure and the like. Well, they're going to switch and be employed by LF but work for and for the benefit of the projects, at least to start, uh, they'll be really dedicated to the ONF projects. And that gives us the, the continuity that we were looking for. Uh, you know, just talking through the whole model here, LF standard model is that projects pay a GNA fee to LF uh, for the operation of the projects. This is across all of, of LF's portfolio and the same will be true for these projects. So a percentage of the income into each of the projects goes to LF to pay for the, you know, the things you see here. Um, but additionally, you know, the projects really are independent entities. They're designed to be independent entities and they can um, and will need to uh, you know, contract with either LF and or third parties for other services as makes sense. And this is really at the, um, you know, the decision for the governing boards to, you know, they can choose to use their funds in various ways. And, um, and so, you know, each project is free to enter service agreements with LF. Um, LF is, you know, you know, does a lot of this and for things like marketing leadership, CICD hosting and for events and the like, um, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And projects are also free to engage in third party services and our projects today already do that. And you're seeing some names here that you may recognize again, if you're attached to some of these projects where the broadband project today is contracting with um, a firm called BISDN and the mobile project is contracting with a number of individuals and uh, and firms for various services, um, and that will continue. And so again, another form of continuity that you know these individuals are full-time employees by LF. These firms and individuals are full-time or otherwise um, are doing specific tasks for different projects, and that can continue. And the projects can choose to you know to extend this or expand this in in various ways moving forward. So I've, I've been talking about the funded projects because a lot of that had to do with the money and how the money is getting used and allocated and directed. But um, you know the um, the new projects for the the modeling work are being created as an unfunded project, and so you know it is getting just the technical project getting launched with its own TST, uh, and the work of OTCC and related work is going to be picked up by this new project. Um, this project will be entirely run by the TST. There's no associated governing board. This, this group is largely independent today and uh, does not leverage a CICD pipeline. This is more of a standards-based activity, though they do have GitHub and, and some other things like that going on. And uh, the plan is to try to continue that um, as is to the greatest extent possible. Um, but this project does not have funds or raise funds, and so it has to operate in a more self-sufficient way. And so the ONF program management and infra teams are providing some limited support to help this group transition and get started. But this group, um, without a budget, needs to you know, operate in a self-sufficient way and find ways um, to, um, you know, be able to get its work done. And you know, and and frankly, 
I think Scott can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, but I think the majority of LF projects actually operate this way with, you know, unfunded or without a governing board and a directed fund. Uh, and so this is a, you know, a tried and true model. Uh, it's not like they're doing something unusual or getting, uh, you know, um, are likely to have difficulty in this model. And I think LF is the perfect place to be operating in this way. Um, it just is kind of different than the three other funded projects. So just in terms of timeline, understanding the big picture, um, you know, we've been, uh, the, you know, the ONF board has been working with LF for, for quite some time, for the majority of the, of the last calendar year, I would say, uh, you know, sort of working this through and thinking through the nuances of this and working with our key stakeholders to try to understand the best way to, to do all of this. Uh, in December, we designed a definitive agreement that, um, you know, was able, you know, that means it's a done deal, really. Now we just have to sort of uh, dot the I's and, and, and get through close and, and make the transition. Uh, and we've announced it publicly. Uh, and we're moving toward the December 31st close. This is when, um, you know, the official legal close of the whole transition, after which point in time, ONF will effectively cease to exist. Uh, it, you know, it needs to exist as a legal entity, just so you know, but it's really going to stop operating. Uh, and the, the four projects are launched and, and off and running at that point in time. This really is a flag day, um, you know, January 31st, when things switch over. And we're in a very important time now you know, through the rest of January now. Um, and, you know, the steps we're now taking are to, number one, make sure all of you and all of our ONF members are aware of and well-informed, and we get to answer all of your questions about what's going on. This webinar is a big piece of that today. Um, then companies get a chance to sign new membership agreements with the new projects. And those companies, you know, if you sign before the close, uh, you're eligible for a credit for any unused portion of your ONF membership dues. Uh, and then with this, the project governing boards are established based on those companies that sign up as premium members in the new projects. And those new um, you know, board members will then get to really set the agenda and the budget for the projects and, and really you know, uh, launch the projects uh, under LF. And so we'll be in a pretty um, you know, important position to really help uh, guide and uh, steer the projects. So for ONF members, the transition looks something like this. That's, you know, through January, but right now, we're updating uh, all of our members, trying to answer all the questions that, that might be coming in. Um, and then, you know, each member is offered an opportunity to join the new projects. You can choose to join one, two, or three of the projects separately. Uh, and um, and then separately, the unfunded uh, project is getting launched as well, but it doesn't have members, and so it doesn't have quite the same, you know, joining sign-up process that the other projects have. Uh, and then I mentioned already, you know, but just, um, you know, to make sure it's really clear that, you know, this, this ONF membership credit is granted based on your pro rata unused portion of your ONF membership dues. It can only be used for membership fees in these new projects. Um, it can't be used for other LF projects uh, from the other portfolio. And it will get distributed proportionally across the projects you choose to join. Uh, but you need to execute particip you know, participation agreements before the end of the month to receive this credit. So you don't have to pay, you don't have to do you know, anything, there won't be any invoicing. You just have to sign the membership agreement um, before the end of the month to, to, um, to be able to participate in this, in this process. And by joining by the end of the month, you get to be uh, considered a founding member of the projects. And I think, um, you know, that's a, a point of pride, but also um, can be quite substantial, especially for the board members, because they really have a chance to set up the agenda and the budgets for the projects. And then when the transaction closes, um, all the members, memberships in ONF will be terminated um, officially, and the new projects will be off and running. So um, all three of the new funded projects have really three tiers of membership, uh, premium, uh, general, and associate uh, tiers. And the premium memberships are what entitle companies to a board seat on the project. Uh, these really gives the projects an opportunity to, to vote on and guide how the funds are spent, um, which I think is a significant benefit and really an important position to play and also an opportunity to help uh, guide and invest in the project um, moving forward. Uh, 
Uh, general members are for for-profit companies, and this is based on a sliding scale and follows, you know, ONF did the same thing based on company revenue. LF does something very similar based on company uh, employee headcount. And so the new model will based on headcount. Most companies will likely fall into similar tiers, but um, you know the, the basis for determining the tiers is, is different. And then associate members, um, and that's free for uh, educational institutions and for nonprofits. And then I'll just reiterate that the unfunded project doesn't have members. So, you know, part of uh, splitting the projects, setting them on their own path and their own destiny, um, enable the projects to also set their own membership fee structures. And uh, we have been working with the key stakeholders and uh, the presumed incoming board members uh, to set uh, and establish the fee structure for each of the projects. And you see that structure here. Um, so, you know, again, the premium members uh, in, entitles a company to a board seat, the sliding scale, and then the, the associate memberships. So, um, you know, the project governing boards. So to join a board, a company must join as a premium member. Uh, and as a founding member, you set the direction, you'll establish the initial budget, and also you'll have input in the selection and hiring of the executive director. Um, you know, part of this is really separating out, and, uh, you know, um, and we'll talk specifically about the plans for executive director for each of the projects in a moment. And we have a current slate of founding board members. Uh, these are all um, individuals from companies that uh, happen to be you know, past stakeholders from our work and are also invested in the work going forward. Uh, and so this is kind of where the board membership stands today, um, but we're still going through the final you know, sign up for the, the, um, the, the membership agreements and whatnot. But you can see we have a number of the, the, um, the individuals here today with us representing all of the projects. Manuel is here with us today from Deutsche Telekom, but we also have Turk Telekom, Radisys, and Netsia represented. Um, with uh, Ether, Larry is here with us today, and Pranav from Intel um, is joining the board. And on P4, we have Nate with us uh, today, but we also have Dan and Deb from Google and Intel is joining the board. And uh, But other companies are also welcome to join the board for the launch. So let's talk about uh, sort of some of the details of, you know, of the functions that support the projects today and, and how these will uh, be transformed as we move forward. So, uh, you know, an important part of our work is the is running the, the, the back end infrastructure and the CICD pipelines for the projects. And that's primarily done by DAF and Joey today that are on ONF staff. Um, and so ONF's CICD team will be moving to LF. Both DAF and Joey will be joining LF um, as employees of LF, but will continue to focus on ONF's projects at least to start to um, ensure continuity. But the hope, of course, is that they're going to be part of a larger team. They'll be able to bring in expertise and be able to perhaps surge with others. And then over time, they'll blend their expertise in with the other expertise from LF um, to benefit really from LF's um, you know, broader, broader base, broader I don't know, and experience and sets of tools and all of that. Uh, for project membership um, operations, Michelle, who's running the um, our, our uh, webinar today will be transitioning to LF as well. Uh, she'll pr be providing a, a really important point of continuity. I think probably all of you have interacted with her in various ways, shapes, and forms. Um, and so I think this will pr uh, really help with the projects. And, and uh, for people, if you're trying to figure out what to do or how to find something or, or, or what's going on, I mean, Michelle is always a great resource for you and I encourage you to reach out to her now and in the future. Uh, then we have a number of contract engineering resources, and I, I describe this in the in the visual depiction as we walk through the this transaction. But you know the broadband project is planning to continue to contract with BISDN, and Ether is continuing to pro, uh, contract with a number of individuals, and uh, GS Lab as a as a firm doing a QA for the Ether project. Uh, for marketing, um, each directed fund will really need to determine what it wants to budget for marketing, and then can outsource that marketing either to LF or to another provider. I think each project is in the process of figuring that out now. Uh, for business development and ecosystem development, um, each directed fund will work with LF and LS business development organization to be able to recruit new members and secure funding. Uh, and then as for the leadership and for the executive director, again, each project will need to decide and, um, if it wants to budget for an executive director or what kind of leadership role um, it, it wants to fund. And it gets to choose and drive its own direction in that regard. So more specifically on the executive director and the leadership for each project, 
Uh, the plan is that uh, LF Broadband plans to hire its own executive director and sort of, you know, so the, the broadband project benefits from it has today an existing under ONF, what's called the Broadband Area Board. And so that same group has been aware of this transition and has been working for a few months on uh, planning for the transition and is working on the hiring of an executive director. Um, Ether and the mobile project I'm planning to run um, in a part-time capacity. So I'll be providing continuity there as well. Uh, and then P4 plans to hire an executive director. Um, and I think uh, I, I'm, I'm honestly not uh, precisely aware of where we are today. Um, you know, Nate might be able to answer, you know, questions in that regard. I know it's part of the budget and it's been kind of being considered. I, I know there was some initial outreach and whatnot too, but I haven't gotten an update in a, in a, in a little while. And, um, but it's, you know, I want everybody to know that LF has committed to help run searches for the new leaders, um, you know, as the, as, um, as directed by the governing boards. And so, you know, if the governing boards uh, plan to hire and, and have defined a, um, a, you know, budget and a job description and kind of know what they want to go after, LF is, um, is, is here to help. So that's kind of, you know, we've gone through the general of how all the piece parts move around. Um, we have now um, just four slides for each of the four major project areas, just to provide sort of a, a quick update on, on, on the project and where you can find more and whatnot too. And then we'll move into a Q&A session. And I see one question came in. I haven't yet really had a chance to read it, um, but please type in your questions too. This is a good time uh, to start to capture questions that you might have. But um, we want to talk about the four projects right now. And Manuel happens to be doing us the favor. He's connecting from an airport on his phone. So I've, I've agreed to, uh, I'll do this slide on his behalf. I just, uh, it'll be easier, but uh, he's here to answer questions. Um, should we have any, should you have any? So the, the, the new LF broadband project will be hosting both the SIBA and the Volta um, project. SIBA is, is more of a specification project. It really defined the architecture for open broadband networks. It's used as a de facto standard across the industry today. It's a widely referenced, uh, even appears in RFPs and the like uh, quite frequently now. Uh, and Volta is the open source technical project for the open broadband, open OLTs. And, you know, these projects have both been very successful in their own right, uh, to the point where these, this open source project is getting deployed actively in live production networks at some of the largest telecom operators worldwide. Uh, it appears in almost every RFP that appears today. It's, you know, a very significant project, and um, there are companies that care a lot about it. And, um, you know, this project, uh, it has its own sort of CICD process and CICD lab and whatnot, and that's, you know, this continues ongoing. Uh, those of you who are intimate with this project know that, you know, we're going through some transition there and, and some work and, and some investment there. Um, but, you know, uh, the next release is is in process right now. It's set to be coming out this month. Um, you know, this project is up and running and running nicely. Uh, there is a TST that we, uh, meets weekly. Uh, it's open to the public and really encourage you to, if you're interested in this project, to attend. It's a great place to get your questions um, asked and answered and uh, to learn more and to really uh, get a pulse of this project. And then there are a couple of pointers here, and you'll see these for the other projects as well. You know, um, for, uh, you know, there's a standard where most of our projects have a docs site, and this is a great place to really see, you know, the documentation for the project or, or the website for the project. And this will point you to um, other resources. And, uh, and then lastly, here is a new link for joining the new project under LF. Um, and this is a click through process. Um, you know, you'll see the governance and whatnot and have a chance to, to sign via DocuSign. Um, you know, this is again, this is one of the places where LF has more infrastructure than ONF had in the past. Uh, so um, it's great, you know, example of how we think leveraging uh, LF's um, kind of experience of, of running projects like this is gonna be beneficial for all of the projects. And here's the link for broadband. Okay, so um, next up is Ether. And so Larry is with us. Larry, you want to say a little something? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Timon. So yeah, the Ether project is fairly broad. It's uh, the, the collection of everything ONF has been doing in private 5G, open RAN, edge cloud, uh, all that work is under the Ether umbrella. Uh, it specifically includes the sub projects that individuals have been active in. Uh, SD core, the microservice based mobile core, there's both a 4G and 5G version of the core. Uh, SD RAN, which is 
ORAN compliant, split RAN, SDN based implementation of the RAN. Uh, Smart 5G is a fairly new project, but it's using SD RAN and SD Core to build out optimized, uh, power optimized solutions in the 5G space. Uh, so it's, it's narrowly, you know, it's focusing on X apps and R apps, but it's also doing quite a bit of work in RAN simulation so that you can test the various solutions that you have. And AMP is the uh, Ether management platform. So it's the glue that holds all of those other subsystems together. Uh, and it's a cloud-based management plane. So all of those fall under the umbrella of, of Ether. And in specifically, if you're thinking about micro-ONOS, it, it is micro-ONOS that is the core of implementing uh, SD-RAN. And actually there's components of micro-ONOS that show up in AMP as well. So that's where that piece of work will fall. Um, so, in this space, there's been quite a bit of activity over the last year as we are, we're turning from Ether as a managed service to Ether as an open source platform anyone can deploy. And one of the more exciting things that's happened there is uh, the SDN, SDRAN work has received a, a pretty good sized grant from the US government to work on this energy efficiency problem. And that's all going to be using the Ether components and building out APIs and models and so on. Um, Opportunity-wise, there's obviously private 5G is a huge, uh, exciting space. But near term, there's quite a there's st we're starting to get traction in three specific areas. One is I've already been talking about developing power optimized 5G. I think that's going to be a, a big deal under the Ether umbrella going forward. Second thing is we're really focusing now on some trial deployments of Ether with some real world applications. So we have. Uh, in manufacturing and in, in uh, uh, outdoor uh, science deployments where we are trying to make observations about the environment. Uh, so there's some trial deployments that are now starting to get traction and we're really anxious to see more of those happen. And, and then thirdly, I'm listing, there's a, we know that SD Core is microservice based, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to make it horizontally scalable and in particular support IOT workloads. So there's a lot, there's a, there's starting to be quite a bit of work, especially in the research community there. And, and as with the other projects uh, there, you can find the project overview uh, for Ether and uh, the docs are the right place to go if you wanna get started. We have been putting quite a bit of effort into making it easy to get up and running with Ether uh, deployed on even a single server, uh, connect real 5G small cells to it and, and get going. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look there. And, and, and again, as, as, as Timon mentioned, you can go click through and, and, and go through the enrollment process to join as a member. So thanks there. And I'm happy to answer questions that you have towards the end. Great. Thanks, Larry. Okay. So that was Ether and the mobile work. Uh, Nate is with us as well. Nate, you want to join us, say a little something? Hi. Uh, yeah. Nate Foster from uh, Cornell University. Um, so I, I think probably most of you have heard of P4, but just to give you a kind of uh, high level overview of what the project is about, um, P4's heritage was a domain specific language designed for uh, a set of um, programmable router ASICs that were emerging about 10 years ago. Um, but uh, over time, and especially in the last few years, the language has um, really kind of broadened its, uh, its base and is now being used um, for a variety of purposes, um, including for programmable router ASICs or switch ASICs, but also um, for other kinds of data planes and more generally sort of non-Turing complete uh, packet processing. Um, so I'm very excited about this, uh, about this transition and, and partnering with uh, Linux Foundation for, on, on this work. Um, and uh, I think it's a great time for P4 to, to take the next step. Um, just to say a few things about kind of how the project is currently run. Um, uh, P4 actually uh, merged into ONF uh, as uh, there was an earlier incarnation of P4 as a as a separate uh, nonprofit. Um, initially started out of Stanford, um, and it's always run in a very um, merit driven and democratic way. So there's a elected technical steering team. I've listed the names here, and there's a series of working groups uh, that cover different aspects of the language and its associated software ecosystem. Um, that are appointed by the technical steering team and um, have always been sort of open to, to anyone uh, to participate in. Um, in terms of where the language is going, um, I've kind of tried to group uh, some, some thrusts into some uh, broad, broad areas. Um, so although P4 has gotten sort of broader use, of course, it's very important that the, that the language have 
uh, hardware targets and, and real hardware targets that are supported by, by vendors. Um, so there's, uh, of course, existing P4 uh, switch targets. Uh, those aren't going away. There's also um, uh, a number of uh, smart NIC targets that are um, using P4 for programming uh, at least parts of, 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 their, um, of their hardware. Um, so that's a, an area where um, we really want to see P4 you know, become the way that, that uh, the pipelines on those targets are, are programmed. Um, and also uh, evolve the language to better uh, match the use cases and, and needs of those targets. Um, another thing that's happened in the last few years is P4 is actually being used on a number of software targets, um, uh, including, for example, DPDK. And there's a group that's been um, building a path for running P4 code in the Linux kernel. Um, so this is uh, perhaps you know, not in the spirit of how the language was initially designed. Um, it was really designed with hardware in mind. Um, but it makes sense that you know, if you have P4 specifications of uh, packet formats and protocols and network functions um, that you shouldn't have to rewrite those things in a different language or with different um, different abstractions just because you want to write it on software. Um, another use of P4 that kind of caught some of us by surprise is um, it's been used as a specification language. Um, so even if you're not using it literally to program uh, a, a data plane, whether in hardware or software, it's uh, a fairly simple language, and it's therefore useful as a way to have a sort of golden reference, you know, uh, bottom line description of, of what the network should do, um, what the data plane should do. Um, and so there are uh, real industrial uses where um, a P4 model is being used as the golden reference and then being used to drive uh, testing and validation um, of uh, ultimately, uh, you know, less programmable or non-programmable targets. And then the fourth area is um, P4 has become a big deal in, in research, um, academic research and industrial research. Um, by some measure, um, something around a third of the papers at SIGCOM, which is the flagship conference for, for computer networking, um, were using P4 in a, in a central way, um, whether, whether in hardware or software last year. Um, and there's also a number of efforts to integrate P4 into courses uh, in universities. Um, making networking courses more hands-on and, and, and concrete. Um, so these are all areas that, uh, that the initial governing board has identified as being promising. Um, and um, we're really excited to, to grow the community and to um, sort of solidify the basis of support for P4 and uses of P4, and also to evolve the language, um, as I said, going forward. Um, so I'll keep it short there. And anyone who's interested in, uh, in the language or where it's going, uh, reach out to me or join one of our working groups. We'd be delighted to have you. All right, thanks, Nate. Yeah, lots going on on the P4 front as well. And then uh, last of the four, uh, Lyndon, to speak about the, the open network model. Okay, thank you, Timon. I'm Lyndon Ong. I'm in the CTO office at uh, Sienna Corporation, and I'm here representing the two standards projects that uh, had been going on in ONF. And uh, they're, they're a bit different from the other projects. Uh, you may notice there's no logo or anything like that. They're much, uh, they're fairly low-key projects. They kind of developed out of um, work originally on OpenFlow and OpenFlow um, optical uh, networking extensions and sort of developed into, um, say, a sort of center of excellence in network modeling in general. So we currently have uh, work on network models and APIs and interfaces. Timon mentioned that uh, much of this work uh, has been adopted in, in operator networks and requirements. And uh, we have a number of specifications that are currently uh, listed on the open networking or uh, website um, as, uh, as uh, standards and model specifications. The four main activities, uh, one is the transport API uh, that's been uh, adopted by some operators and uh, cited in a number of operator requirements for uh, SDN control of transport networks. We also have a 5G uh, XFOL group that has developed a number of specifications uh, that uh, I think those are the ones that Timon referenced as being having been adopted in, in some cases in, in deployments of thousands of devices. Uh, we also have a, a core information model activity um, that is kind of at a, a even more, um, say, basic level. And we have a, a small group called ISOMI, uh, Informal Inter-SDO Open Model Initiative, um, which sort of coordinates across a number of different SDOs, including um, ITUT um, and, and others, uh, in how models are developed. So. 
um, future. Uh, these two projects are going to be merged into a single project, Open Network Modeling and Interfaces in Linux Foundation. Uh, as Timon mentioned, it's going to be an unfunded standards project. The two current uh, technical steering teams will merge into a single one uh, for the ONMI project. Um, it's a good deal, or most of the core information model work is actually migrating to an ITU study group, study group 15 under some previous agreements. Uh, but otherwise, we expect to try and continue our regular weekly calls and Zoom sessions and aim to have minimal disruption through the transition to Linux Foundation. Um, as membership is open, anyone's welcome to join and please just reach out to me for uh, details about activities and how to participate. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Lyndon. Okay, so uh, that's kind of uh, the end of our prepared remarks uh, and background and maybe uh, all of our panelists, if you would, uh, maybe you could uh, come back. Um, but we have a number of questions coming in now, so maybe we could try to work our way through some of this and, and see if we can get all your questions answered. Uh, but just on this slide, I did summarize you know, some pointers that you really should be aware of. The announcement provides a lot of detail. There's also an FAQ document that um, uh, we've tried to capture and answer all questions. It's a live Google Doc, actually, so it gets updated if, if new things uh, come up. Uh, you know, Very importantly, the three links for being able to sign up for the new projects. And, uh, and I would uh, also just mention that, uh, you know, Michelle is a key resource here and she's available with her ONF address and then soon with an, an LF address um, for direct outreach. So uh, let's see, uh, we have some kind of more membership related questions and we'll uh, start at the top here. Um, so there's a question around, um, is it possible to cash out of unused ONF membership dues? And I would say, unfortunately, no, that's a byproduct of the nonprofit nature of, of ONF and similar organizations, um, you know, it, it's uh, this part of the bylaws and, and you know, um, foundations like ours cannot refund um, uh, fees. Uh, there are a bunch of reasons for that. Um, and then uh, and then there is a second part of this question. If not, you're able to commit more funds. Is it possible to transfer without paying more? So you know the the dues are the dues uh, with LF, and so I think this is probably a small company, and and perhaps um, for smaller companies, I think the effective fees uh, will be going up, unfortunately. So do know that um, you know that is the structure under LF. It just really costs quite a lot to be able to just manage a member uh, with really low dues. Um, but remember that the technical projects are open, and so you know, we're not trying to create barriers to participation. Um, but um, there are barriers to being able to direct if you want to be involved in directing the the pool of you know uh, you know more than a million and a half dollars or whatnot too we're we're looking for companies that are also able to step up and participate to be able to do that um, with their own funds um let's see from thorson there's from telefonica there's a question about uh publishing work so when's when's the last time you can publish uh, under ONF, I think, you know, and this is from the standards related work. So, I mean, really ONF is wrapping up by the end of this month in January, and, and we had some discussions back in December with the group. I think there is some pending work that they're hoping to publish before the end of the month. I haven't received an update on that. Um, we still have yet to work out some of the details. Um, you know, both Scott and Lyndon are here today, but kind of exactly how the standards-based work is going to work under LF. Um, so there's a you know a meeting next week, and some of the key stakeholders are getting together. So more information will be getting shared. Um, and but there's some things we're still working out there to be um, you know uh, as we move forward. Uh, let's see. Um, and if any of, of the other panelists here, yeah, uh, I can I can jump in time and on the next couple of questions. I see they're either related. Yeah, good, please. Yeah, so um, there's a question about Ether, what release of 3GPP is currently supported and what are the plans? The, the current release is uh, currently the software is at release 15. Work has been underway and there should be an upgrade uh, coming out fairly soon that's going to skip ahead to um, 17. Uh, but let me just add kind of a little color to that, which is to date, Ether has been quite focused on private 5G. So some of the features that are coming out in various releases are more important to a telco version that might be an enterprise. And one of the things Ether is quite interested in is 
how can we shape 5G in a way that supports enterprises and, and private deployment? So keep, keep that in mind as you think about, uh, you know, following the sequence of 3GPP releases. Um, so there's also a question about running Ether on top of P4 based switching fabric. And there's nothing keeping you from doing that. Uh, that was the way the original Ether was deployed. But as we rebuild deployment machinery, we have not yet included a P4 substrate underneath it. And, the, and specifically what that means is that we're using uh, the uh, microservice-based UPF and not the P4 UPF. Uh, but like I said, there, there is an avenue that you can contribute, which is to support different configurations of Ether, including the configuration that has P4 switches in it. So it's a matter of adding that back into the to the on-ramp deployment machinery. Uh, but it is not specifically supported today. I guess there's some more. There's a and question if someone else wants to jump in with other um, questions here, go please go ahead. I have to catch up with the questions. Yeah. Well, there's a, a question here. It's sort of a crossover question because, um, as many of you know, that um, P4 was used in the mobile project to do a P4-based UPF, um, and uh, uh, you know, so is there still kind of that collaborative kind of our crossover-related work taking place right now? I don't know, Larry. You want to speak up? Well, I think maybe this one's a good one for 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 Nate. Um. I have to say, I'm, I'm not aware of um, a whole lot of activity at the, in the crossover, um, which is not to say that it couldn't emerge in the future. Um, I'm just not personally aware of. Uh, I, I, I was looking specifically at the sonic pins question. Oh, there. sorry. Maybe, okay. Um, maybe I'm looking at the wrong question. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry for that question. Um, yes. I'll say certainly um, from my perspective, and I'm aware of some uh, collaborations and discussion with the sonic community um, using P4 to give uh, at least, uh, you know, definitions of uh, reference pipelines and, you know, executable um, versions of, of the APIs. Um, that's something that I think is very cool. And it, for me personally, is a, is a priority. And I think there's a number of other people who also feel that way. Let's see. Uh, Ajay is asking if, uh, um, if LF has any lab infrastructure. Um, so, um, as many of you know, ONF used to have you know a fair amount of lab infrastructure. Over the last um, two years, we've really been splitting up that lab infrastructure and distributing it around. Uh, ONF as an organization uh, went full virtual um, about a year and a half ago, uh, but we have labs. Um, Deutsche Telekom uh, hosts a, a lab for the broadband project in Berlin, um, but it really is an ONF and a community lab. Uh, we have a lab uh, in India for Ether that um, is uh, run by GS Labs as part of the Ether uh, you know, um, QA process. Uh, we do have a lab in Akolo that um, you know, supports some of our infrastructure, but I would say at this point in time, you know, 90, 80, 90 percent of our infrastructure has moved full virtual and into the cloud as well. So I see a question about the Ether TST. Um, for the for the near term future, it will be. I mean, I think all the TSTs are just meeting as they have been. We're trying to be as minimally disruptive as possible. So all the links that you have will still work, and uh, it won't be until we have um, the new infrastructure that whatever we need, the new Slack, the new email, what, and all of those things set up that we will start changing those links. Someone's asking if there's a list of members in the new project. So we're just opening the sign up process right now. So we don't have a list of uh, new members for the new projects um, at the moment. Let's see. Uh, Mark is asking about um, the fee structure and is it necessary to pay an LF membership fee in addition to the project specific participation fee? And uh, the short answer is is uh, yes, I don't know, Scott is here. So maybe Scott, you'd like to answer this about sort of the LF structure for membership. Sure. Um, 
uh, what what we'll typically do is is the Linux Foundation itself as a member, and then when you participate in one of the directed funds, uh, you're doing so as a, a member of the Linux Foundation. So membership of the LF is required. Um, uh, in participating in the technical projects, however, membership isn't required, and so anyone can continue to participate in the technical technical projects without being a member of the LF. So I, I, I'm just jumping in, maybe I'm a little out of order here. I see a question about Onos. I mentioned earlier that Onos is micro Onos, the reinvention of Onos that really was took place because of SD-RAN as much as anything as part of Ether or it's part of SD-RAN. Traditional Onos as it existed before uh, is still included under the umbrella of I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's still included under the P4 broad project. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I know a lot of people use Onos and the tutorial is still quite popular and people are using it to understand Onos, SDN, P4. That should still just work as, as it has. Yeah, at the risk of echoing, I think, some points that Timon has made, um, you know, the there's sort of two two um, two things to say. One is that the day-to-day -day operational uh, running of these projects is is mostly not changing. You know, the TSTs open to participation from anyone. The new governing boards, which are tied to the membership models, you know, will help set the sort of longer-term direction and look after the financial um, health of, of these of these different projects. Um, so I think you know it's natural that there will be, you know, changes, new new directions explored, old directions that get less less uh, actively ex explored, um, and to some extent, you know, we're all just stewards of of these projects, and um, of course we'll shape them. But but it's it's kind of up to the people who uh, and organizations who step up and participate. Um, well, I have the mic. I'll jump in and answer um, uh, Sayavanga Peter's question. Uh, the question is. Any future projections that P4 will be a universal one and compete with other well-known languages? Um, <clears throat> I'll give my my personal opinion, which I think reflects that of many in the community. Um, I think making P4 a general-purpose language would be a mistake. You know, the, it's a domain-specific language that was designed for restricted networking devices, um, and the fact that the language is restricted is one of the things that makes it. Um, Kind of special compared to C or Rust or or Java, um, it's it's simpler, it's easier to analyze and model, it's easier to compile. Um, so if we went all the way to a general purpose language, it would sort of lose its reason for being. Now, having said that, uh, I do feel that P4 should embrace other languages. So you know, it should be much easier to build systems that combine some part that you program in P4 with some part that you program in some other uh, some other language or some other framework. Um, and right now, that still requires a lot of engineering, and it'd be great to reduce that 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 you know burden um, potentially by evolving the language and also some software development. All right, I see a question about the ambassador program, and I want to share that um, you know the ambassador program was an ONF wide program, and since we're dividing all the projects and putting them on their um, own separate courses, um, the thinking is that we're going to. Um, uh, you know, end the ONF ambassador program and encourage ambassadors to kind of engage in those projects uh, where you have specific alignment. And uh, there still will be opportunities to, um, you know, evangelize and promote and be out there uh, with the projects. And we encourage that. But we want to, you know, separate it from a monolithic program into a, a distributed program attached to the, to the specific projects. Uh, there's also a question about where you know ONF had you know published standards in the past and and where can these standards be found moving forward. And the plan is for the ONF website to uh, continue to publish those um, standards. There are a number of, of of standards and whatnot that are definitely important from a um, an on, you know both an historic perspective and kind of an ongoing use perspective. And so we don't plan to just um, disrupt that. Um, where it is you know. A, a, Three years from now, I'm not sure, you know, to be really frank, uh, but we, we understand the value and the importance of those standards. We don't plan for those to disappear, uh, and we need to uh, make sure that they are um, properly available um, in perpetuity going forward. Um, let's see, other questions anybody want to pick up?
All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So um, there, uh, I think we've gotten through most of the questions, but I think uh, I need to look through some of this. There may be something that we can follow up with individually and independently. Um, if you have questions around the technical projects, I encourage you to really engage with those technical communities. Uh, they all have email and Slack channels and TST calls and whatnot. Uh, and if you have anything organizationally and structurally, please reach out to us, reach out to me, reach out to Michelle, um, and we'll help you get your questions answered. Remember, you know, end of January is a really important deadline. Um, we want to help you all, you know, smoothly make this transition moving forward, make sure the technical projects don't get disrupted in this process. Uh, thank you all very much for participation. We've had, uh, you know, quite a number of attendees. Um, it shows, you know, the, the, the extent of the interest and support for ONF. Really pleased to see that. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for joining us here today um, and for the effort they're putting into the new projects and the leadership they're showing in helping to drive the projects going forward. Um, and I see, you know, a couple of, um, of, of names from the past as well who've been participating in the projects and whatnot uh, in the list of participants. I want to just thank everybody for everybody's participation over the years. Um, it's been sort of a remarkable amount of impact that ONF has had uh, in these projects and the work we've done. I'm really excited to see where the work continues to grow and expand and continue to have impact. I think this is an exciting next step for the projects. The goal has always been to put the work into open source, to try to launch it and, and have it um, you know, uh, drive itself autonomously uh, moving forward. And I think that this is uh, you know, a great step in that direction. So um, you know, kudos to everybody who's been involved in the process and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with everyone as we move forward into this next phase. Thank you.